We are going to have HFTF members provide a report on our new member-driven initiative called Peer Exchanges. These are small group policy discussions aimed at uh, facilitating collaborative dialogue between public, private, and nonprofit stakeholders, and really taking a deep dive into shared uh, energy policy and planning objectives. So, um, what ended up happening was the peer exchanges brought together folks that actually haven't been in the same room together or typically don't engage with one another, but yet work collaboration amongst these groups is needed. Um, and so, in our inaugural round, we had uh, three peer exchanges all focused on transportation. And as we saw today, we've made a lot of progress in the electricity sector, um, though we still have a long way to, way to go. But for ground transportation and transportation more broadly, um, you know, we're not even on the chart. So you can see that there's an increasing emphasis on transportation, and you'll see synergies between what was discussed in the last panel and uh, the work being led by the HPF members in these peer exchanges. So um, we have um, Alexander DeRode from Maui County, who will be talking about the Mitigation Resilience Equity Nexus. Riley Saito, um, he led a peer exchange um, bringing together um, state and county procurement officers, uh, fleet managers, and, and energy stakeholders to talk about how do we transition um, fleets to electric vehicles. And then lastly, Joelle Simon Pietri, uh, she did a recent peer exchange I'm looking at benchmarking um, greenhouse gas emissions and low carbon transportation policy. I'm Alex DeRoad, Energy Commissioner for the County of Maui. So, Mitigation Resilience Equity ne uh, Nexus, or MRE, not to be confused with uh, Meals Ready to Eat. And the, the slides are flying by here already, uh, a little <laughs> faster than planned. Is there uh, a way to slow it down? Okay. Um, so first, this is our ragtag crew uh, who attended the uh, MRE Nexus uh, Peer Exchange. And you can see some of the participants uh, represented at, at the gathering. Um, I just want to say what a, a value the format of the Peer Exchange is and really allowing us to come together as, as uh, individuals who are working on the ground on some of these projects share uh, lessons learned, best practices, and put our uh, heads together to brainstorm on solutions to some of our biggest challenges. So um, I want to really recognize uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for creating that opportunity. And then with the leadership of um, Ben Sullivan and uh, partnering up with him, uh, we kind of came around this concept of let's bring this, let's apply this notion or this uh, framework of the mitigation resilience equity nexus to electrification of transportation. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into this here, but uh, one of our uh, one of our core uh, values at this at these gatherings is to be collaborative and not for one person to stand up there and speak while everyone listens. And we were told if we didn't do that, uh, the demon would come and you know, make sure that we do. So we were all very collaborative. Uh, the demon then began to dance with uh, one of our experts we were able to bring in, uh, Kristen Baja of Urban Sustainability Directors Network. This uh, peer exchange was organized on the shoulder of the Hawaii Congress of Planning Officials. And so it really took advantage of um, a lot of people were already there, so trying to minimize carbon footprint, you know, we're, we're there uh, for two events at, at once, and also having a, a lot of the experts and stakeholders um, able to participate in both events and inform um, one another. So uh, we were able to benefit from the knowledge of Kristen Baja with Urban Sustainability Directors Network, as well as the city of Fort Collins, where they've been uh, helping to lead nationally on this concept of mitigation, resilience, and equity. It's an emerging uh, framework, and basically we, we had some discussions about whether MRE was the right name for it, or whether it might be ERM, Equity Resilience Mitigation, right? So the, the, the whole focus of this is how do we lead with equity in our policy making, in our uh, projects, etc., rather than just leading with mitigation, right? If we start the conversation saying, we want to figure out how to reduce carbon, and make it more resilient, and then, oh yeah, don't, let's not forget equity and see how we throw that in there. The preferred approach would be, let's start with equity. How do we start with equity? That's the, that's the 
priority and then move to resilience and mitigation um, within that framework. Okay, so this was not about just uh, sitting there and, and listening to people, it was very hands-on, interactive. Um, it gets messy when you do that, right? It looks something like this, these brainstorming flowcharts. Um, and I have to go faster because I don't have much time. But one of the key concepts here, along with just this notion of equity, is the concept of targeted universalism. And that's looking at, rather than focusing on trying to benefit the greatest number of people, how about focusing on starting with those who have the most need, right? who are historically uh, in a more disadvantaged situation. Start there and then scale that up to being able to uh, impact more people. So targeted universalism. Some of the outcomes of, of our brainstorming, we're looking at community resilience hubs, um, changing state procur procurement rules around rental vehicles. For example, what Ben was saying to allow uh, state and county employees to rent electric vehicles uh, when we're on county or state business. Um, improving walkability around high transit corridors and allowing county fleets to be used by third party partners. And this is something that I know Riley is very passionate about. Um, for example, if, when our county vehicle, fleet vehicles are not being used, could they be used by an Uber driver or a, a Lyft driver? Okay. I encourage you to go to the HEPF newsletter. They have a very good synopsis of this workshop if you want to uh, get more of the details. I will say that, uh, just in closing, that this forum really allows us, as the counties, the state, nonprofits, and private sector entities, to get together and have these really critical brainstorming um, gatherings. It allows us to learn from what each of us is doing in our respective counties or municipalities and, and creates a lot of benefits. So thank you again and thank you for listening. Okay, so I'm just gonna, which, where do I point? Uh, just around there. The side one, right on the side. Right there we go. All right. So I'll just skip that. Okay. So as background to leading up to the peer exchange, we knew that we had a uh, the third party financing bill going through a legislature, legislature, and it was being you know this is like a year ago and pretty uh, positive in its path. So in preparation, you know, lots of times policy or, or statutes get enacted and then it takes about three years to actually do something. So it, rather than having that approach to accelerate the, uh, kind of clear the path, we had road mapped out um, assuming the enactment of the HRS 1, uh, 3642. And in the meantime, uh, Ulupono and uh, State Energy Office and, and myself worked on the Rocky Mountain Institute Mobility Innovation Lab Workshop, which would be a framework in which the HRS could be implemented and what needed to be done to implement it. Then in the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum actual peer exchange, it was to take the pull-throughs or takeaways from the Rocky Mountain Institute to actually then drill down closer to actual implementation and who need, and the people involved needed to be those involved with actual implementation of transformation of government vehicles to be zero emission. So that's the group that uh, attended Rocky Mountain Institute, it's State Energy Office, Ulupono, uh, a couple of investors, DAGS, DOT, and so we went through four or five days, came out with uh, the various, uh, you know, outlining the goals and efforts of state and county, mobility requirements, and I stress mobility, not transportation, to create the uh, correct framework of moving people, products, or services from point A to point B to where it needs to be. So transportation implies people and vehicles, but it's broader than that the mobility, um, what we're targeting. 
So, you know, create benchmarks, explore opportunities, inter intergovernmental agency cooperation, collaboration, elevate the knowledge base for all, with all. Explore advanced joint procurement language practices in the existing 103D procurement statute along with the, the new HRS uh, 3642. So then within the peer exchange is bringing people that normally don't even know each other, but they work for the same government, same department. So it's to listen, learn, and share. Clarity on navigating government procurement process. Hear from the fleet uh, vehicle owners or managers from the government agencies and, and discuss how to advance clean mobility within government agencies. Allow us to hear the various uh, opinions, thoughts, ideas, not challenge them. And then establish next steps, agree upon next steps on where to go, how to get there, how to, how to benchmark them. Then, and this is the stage we're in right now, to maintain the connection, to maintain that relationship, that collaboration, that, that knowledge base uh, sharing with each other. So here's a list, uh, I won't necessarily go through it, except uh, one of the side things is in the support, the traffic demand management. You know, Because of all of this, if we share vehicles, we have less vehicles, we have need, less need for parking, the vehicles that are there, they're clean and they're more productive. There's more vehicle, clean vehicle miles that are being provided. Then on the mobility hub in Hawaii County, we've been approaching this from an equity lens, that we are focusing on how to lift up and the quality of life, accessibility to mobility, the type of mobility, with the 48% Alice population on our island, that of which near 40% have to travel more than 50 miles to work. So that is a lens of focus where we're taking our analysis. Um, we've also, although there's a bunch of people on the out, outer circle, and in the inner circle is our, our topics or subjects that need to be addressed or discussed. There's our transportation hui, there's about 80 people in that network. So with the uh, next steps from the peer exchange is the fleet analysis, the vehicle availability where Dave's gonna give us driverless cars and uh, fueling and charging infrastructure and the actual cost saving model of either purchase, lease or HRS 3641 the actual next step is either issues RFIs and or RFPs. Um, Robin has, has fired off the first shot with his RFP and uh, for services contracts. And that's due, I think, January 14th. But there are other considerations that we're going through as far as uh, developing an RFI. I'll just add uh, before we move on that uh, what oh, was clicking that, I think. what Riley was sharing about Alice uh, asset limited income constrained and employed is a much broader issue that we need to tackle in this state when rather than just looking at the below poverty level. So we're we're talking about 48 percent across our state that are asset limited income constrained and employed, including those under poverty level. And these peer exchanges really allow us to share our best practices. So this concept of the Alice report came to the other counties from City and County of Honolulu or County of Hawaii was leading it. Um, learning about best practices, whether it's you know our, our county council, for example, having recently created uh, a climate, resilient, climate action and resilience committee, how other counties might be able to model that, or looking at the work City and County of Honolulu did on climate change, sustainability and resilience office and how we might model that. So really sharing these best practices has been of tremendous value, including on these peer exchanges. So I'm Joel Simone Pietri, so I had the third um, and um, perhaps largest greenhouse gas peer exchange. Peer exchange. It was uh, nearly 40 people. 
And um, so, uh, Lake was touched on with the keynote speakers when we got started today, but um, there is a, a fair amount of policy outside the state that actually handles the nexus between climate, transportation, and energy goals. And so what we did is unpack that and take a look at four different examples and take a look at what would and would not um, be applicable or desirable in Hawaii. So um, just kind of, you know, I'm going to go in order, you know, what we talked about, um, why, uh, you know, what the call to action for, why it is that we're actually talking about this particular topic at this particular point in time, and then um, who was involved. And I'm just planning to go until I'm told I'm out of time. So. Okay, so starting off with the actual results and outcomes. Um, collectively, um, there was, uh, we actually did some voting um, in, uh, in, the two day, in the two days of event at the Pure Exchange and at the summit that it was um, in conjunction with. And then also had some discussion. And so uh, we, we reviewed all the notes and pulled that together into some policy recommendations. So three recommendations for actual legislation and then um, two, legis uh, two recommendations for administrative action. And um, so the first one is actually a request from uh, Jennifer Potter at the PUC to clarify the statutory requirements to consider greenhouse gas uh, impacts. It's actually not just in that statute. Um, there's a requirement to consider greenhouse gas impacts in several um, statutory and regulatory um, you know, policies across the state, but they are very loosely defined, usually not much more than just that sentence fragment. And um, uh, the second one is um, in terms of actual sort of public-private partnerships and helping to facilitate actual action uh, as a recommendation to expand HTDC's authority to be able to match federal research grants and contracts for um, uh, climate action, aviation sustainability, and renewable energy. Right now, they're restricted only to small business innovation research, which is a very specific program, and to Office of Naval Research, and they can't actually provide that um, funding for any other uh, federal, pro federal much matching funds for any other federal program. Um, the third one is to establish a sustainable aviation task force to um, uh, put together a flight plan for how the state will help the international airlines serving Hawaii meet the international United Nations obligations under CORSIA, or the Carbon Offset and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. On the administrative side, uh, we spent a fair amount of time looking at California, Oregon, and British and um, international low carbon fuel standards and recommending that the state administration consider joining the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is how those states on the West, US West Coast, or the North American West Coast, actually harmonize their transportation and greenhouse gas policy. And then consider a reciprocity memorandum with California Air Resources Board to have some way for Hawaii to opt into the low carbon fuel standard um, without actually going to uh, adopt some really complicated legislation. So um, I'm going to blow past through the why, because we've already covered that. Um, and these are the two court cases that um, where final decisions by a state agency, the Pia Public Utilities Commission, and then a county decision were overturned because of a failure to properly consider greenhouse gas impacts, as well as other things. Um, and so this is part of the reason why we had this pure exchange. You've seen this pie chart before. One thing I would like to point out that we learned um, from the greenhouse gas life cycle analysis is, is that going forward, I strongly recommend that we no longer lump together light passenger vehicle and heavy transportation in the same category, underground transportation. Ground transportation is an umbrella term, but you're talking about very different purposes of that transportation. So, you know, evaluating an 18-wheel, you know, tractor trailer that's carrying cargo on the same vehicle miles traveled as a light passenger vehicle is just not appropriate, and you end up having significant unintended consequences. They also have extremely <coughs> different carbon life cycle uh, performance when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. All right, so what we looked at. Um, I put 
uh, greenhouse gas policy into three bins. Um, the one on the left is environmental impact statements. The one in the middle is carbon tax and cap and trade. Both of these are in effect in Hawaii today. The third category that uh, we did the deep dive on is transportation fuel mandates. And within transportation fuel mandates, we looked at international, national, and also state. Some of the similarities in, to compare and contrast some of these is, is that the point of obligation is different. A transportation fuel mandate, the point of obligation is usually on a fuel blender and distributor. What's also different about it is the third category, these transportation fuel mandate, mandates, they were all set up as market-based measures. They're not a tax. It's not taking money from the private sector or the public or the general public, transferring it to the state, and then it goes into a general fund or a special fund and it's distributed from there. They're market-based measures so that the private sector and the general public do the cost-benefit analysis to determine what the highest and best way to address the greenhouse gas life cycle emissions reduction that's desired, how to do that most cost-effectively. So here's the US federal version. This is the renewable fuel standard. It's categorical and it's based and it basically values fuel based on the greenhouse gas life cycle performance. There's three different categories. And how a life cycle analysis is done is uh, life cycle basically is three different parts. What you make a fuel out of or what you make an energy component out of how you actually convert it into fuel or an energy form, and then its end use. And this last part, the end use, is why uh, when we actually did our breakout groups and our case studies and actually looked at the three different, uh, four different end uses, air, marine, light ground, and heavy ground, is why we're making the recommendation to not lump, together, lump those together going forward. I want to thank all of you for attending our annual briefing um, and to everyone who made this event possible, um, our members, the speakers, our graduate students, Dallas, Sarah, and Lena. Um, Lena recently graduated, but she still came out and helped us out today. Um, and then our administrative support staff, and as well as those um, at the Capitol. So thank you all. Um, we look forward to seeing you again next year, and in the meantime, we want to uh, let you know to check out our website. We have a bunch of resources, legislative and docket resources, um, and we also have an energy events calendar where we compile all the different energy events going on in Hawaii. And so there's the state climate conference on January 13th and 14th at, at, at the East West Center, so we invite you to join us there as well. Um, a recording of the annual briefing will be available on our website, so thank you to Think Tech Hawaii for coming and recording uh, today's briefing, and we also have other energy shows um, on our website as well.